<laughs> so we're, we're beginning a new series titled Love Like Jesus, and I'm excited for this series. We're going to talk about this topic through the month of January into February. There's a lot of ground to cover, and we're not going to cover it all here in this message. But I think that uh, what we have to talk about, the stories from the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, the stories that I'm going to share, and those teachings I'm going to share, I think that you'll find them to be very relevant. Because who among us doesn't want to become better at loving in 2017? And I mean like extending love to those that we are dedicated to, those around us, and receiving love as well, which is sometimes a difficult thing. We're going to talk about one of the things that stands in the way, because the, the premise of today's message that I'm going to get into is going to be simply this, that to love like Jesus, you've got to learn to be loved like Jesus. It starts with that, because you can't pour out what hasn't been poured into you. So, uh, I want to ground this in some scripture, so we're going to show the scripture uh, in every message. This is at the end of his ministry. He uh, is about to um, have his last meal with his disciples, and he teaches them one final lesson, and he defines what it means to be his follower, a disciple. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, not your church attendance, or your Bible knowledge, or many of the things that we associate with being a uh, you know, follower of Jesus, but by this, your ability to love like I love, everyone will know that you are my disciple, if you love one another. So that, that's the operating scripture that Jesus defines for us. Um, today's teaching I titled, Have It Your Way. And I got the title from, for this message, from the place where all preachers get their titles, which is from Burger King. So I thought, that, <laughs> no, we would watch this. Have it your way. Have it your way. Have it your way at Burger King. May I help you, sir? Two Whoppers, two Whopper Juniors, and four Coca-Cola. And would I have to wait long if you made one Whopper with no pickle and no lettuce? No, sir. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. Oh, well, in that case, could I have the other Whopper with extra ketchup? Sure. We can serve your broad beef Whopper fresh with everything on top of any way you think. Now that's the way to do things, our way. Have it your way, have it your way at Burger King, at Burger King. Now I don't know why, but I just feel like a round of applause for 1974. Did anyone see that commercial growing up? Yes. Anybody? Come on, be honest now, right? <laughs> my favorite part is the wife when she's like. Oh, in that case, I'll customize my order too, right? <laughs> so Burger King, they are not the first people to come up with this idea of having your way. A little history lesson for you. Um, Marshall Field of Marshall Fields the Department Store, he is credited, or one of the few people credited, for coming up with this phrase that we all know. The customer is always right. And apparently before the customer is always right became kind of the phrase associated with customer service and buying things, the phrase was, I kid you not, at least Wikipedia says this, the phrase was, buyer beware. Think about the difference between those two, buyer beware, like we're going to get you, versus the customer is always right. And, and this idea, it, it has become part of our culture, would you say? And, and it's developed, and, and then add to it the fact that uh, we've had these technological advances that has allowed us to not only be right, like in the setting of a department store or a restaurant, but we can get on Amazon, and not only can we be right there, but we can get exactly what we want. I don't want that shade of blue, I want a different shade of blue, and Amazon will send that to us, or wherever you like to shop online. So, you know, we live in a day and age where we get to be right, and we get to have what we want to have. Now, who of you have gone shopping for jeans in perhaps the last 20 years? Am I right? Okay? All right, so like, if you were to go shopping, you would see probably something like this, which is a wall of jeans, right? And what I've been told, um, I wasn't really around for this, sorry, but back in the day, apparently there was like Levi's 501s, and that was it, right? 
But now there's multiple brands, multiple styles, multiple fits. If you want baggy jeans, you can get baggy jeans. If you want you know, slim cut jeans, you can be like Conor O'Brien. It's a slim <laughs> cut jeans out there. Huh? You can get it your way today. It's part of our culture. There, there, there's one place that is the king of this culture of customization. And it's a place that I bet many of you go. And, and, and it's a place that you go in the morning, typically, because you got to get something to wake up. Anybody got any messages? Starbucks, right? So Starbucks is like the king of customization. Look at this cup, all right? Now, some of you know um, that before coming to work here, I actually worked for Starbucks for a few months because I didn't know how long it would take to find a pastor job after I finished my rotation as a chaplain. And so I can decipher this for you. Here's what it says. This person wants one-third decaf, three-shot, one-half sugar-free vanilla syrup, one-half sugar-free hazelnut syrup, soy milk, light whipped cream, extra hot at exactly 175 degrees, white mocha latte. It's eight customizations. And, you know, I'm not hating on this. This was kind of typical at Starbucks. In fact, if you want to get, like, a barista to look at you really funny at Starbucks, go in and order a black coffee. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, know, like, what, you, you want some cream in that? You want like a little like... So this is the age of customization that we live in, where the customer is always right. And I'm not saying this is all bad. In fact, I enjoy it. You know, hey look, if, if this age of customization allows you to be more true to the unique brand of humanity God created you to be, then thumbs up. If you want to get a shark fin and put it on the top of your car because you like sharks, you can probably find that on the internet. All praise to you. If you like flames and rhinestones, you want to get some jeans with that action going on, great. Right? There's an upside to this culture of customization where the customer is always right. But there's also a downside. And there's a difficult side here because there's, there's a promise that is part of this age of Customization it, it is a false promise. It says that because you can get it your way in certain places, that you should always get it your way. That that's always possible. And, and this becomes not only you know, an issue in our culture, it, it's ultimately a spiritual issue. And what I mean by a spiritual issue is that it's an issue that has existed for all periods of time and in all places. It doesn't matter what year it is, and it doesn't matter what part of the world we're in. This false promise of having it my way is something that all human beings struggle with. In fact, there's an old, old story that I bet you a lot of you are familiar with. It. It's in the book of Genesis in the third chapter, and it's about the, the original human beings. And the story goes that Adam and Eve lived in paradise, a place called the Garden of Eden. And they had everything that they needed including an intimate relationship with the God that created them and loves them. But then the serpent comes around and begins to whisper in their ear and say, there is one thing you're not allowed to have. And don't you think you should have it? Isn't that evidence that because there's this one thing out there that you're not allowed to have, that you shouldn't be able to trust God? And we can connect with this, can't we? Because in life, all of us have had something that we think we should have, and it becomes a sort of idol to us, and it, and it keeps us from appreciating all that we do have. And Adam and Eve, because they, they buy into this idea that they should have it their way, they should have everything they want, they go ahead and they get it, and there's a consequence. They lose their innocence, and they're ultimately kicked out of the garden. And the story is at the beginning of the Bible because it teaches us a fundamental spiritual issue that all of us struggle with. Let me put it a different way for you. Have you ever hung out with a two-year-old? <laughs> or a three-year-old, right? They call it the terrible twos, the tyrannical threes, because if you know anything about developmental psychology, then that two-year-old, that three-year-old, they are just beginning to come to grips with the fact that you can't always have it your way. And so mommy or daddy says it's time to go to bed, and they throw a fit. Even though mom and dad realize that the kid needs to sleep. Or the kid throws a fit because they want to eat candy and cake, and mom and dad put vegetables and fruit in front of the child. And part of growing up, part of maturing as a human being, is getting over this desire to have it your 
way. Now, it makes sense to me that if this is such a prevalent issue in our development and a prevalent spiritual issue that is captured even at the beginning of the Bible, that Jesus, when he teaches us to pray, he would teach us to start off this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Y'all see the theme here? Your name, your kingdom, your will. And it's only after you pray this way that then you say, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our mistakes, our sins. Protect us from the evil one. And we generally want to go to straight to that, give me, protect me, forgive me. But Jesus is saying that in us is this desire to have it our way. And it's a, it's a false hope. And the more we go down that road, the more suffering we're going to experience, and the more suffering we're going to cause. And so when you pray, which you should do every day, start off by declaring it's not about your own name being lift it up. It's about God's kingdom. It's not about your kingdom, which we all have a kingdom. And if everybody realized that, you know, I'm the king, you're the queen, things would go good, right? Just listen to me, right? But it's God's kingdom. And it's God's will. God's plan. Not our own. And you know this to be true because you had a plan and it didn't work out as you planned. And those of you that know me well, you know that I'm a bit of a planner. I'm not saying we don't have plans in life, but there is this fundamental spiritual issue at hand. And Jesus teaches this because he realizes this. Having it your way stands in the way. That having it your way stands in the way. Let me give you an example from my life, my marriage. My wife never knows I'm going to tell these stories, so that's always exciting. So, um... Believe it or not, I like to have it my way when it comes to our kitchen. My way is that the kitchen doesn't have anything on the countertops. That's when it's clean. And they've been wiped down, right? So they got that kind of shine. Anybody, anybody with me on that? Yeah, Peter, Peter, okay. I learned it from my mother. She raised her hand, right? And so that is the way I like it. And so when I come in at the end of the day and there's like some bowls in the sink or some stuff out on the countertop, some mail or what have you, I'm, I'm not going to lie, like my lower self, on my bad days, many days, I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm a car, you know, and, and I like to cook, but before I cook, i got to have it all clean before I mess this place up, right? You know, that's just me, okay? Um, that's the way I like it. And, and so I get angry. I get frustrated. And I get wrapped up into that because I'm not getting to have it my way. But when I step back and I look at my life and I think, what do I really want when I come home? <laughs> is it a clean kitchen? Or is it closeness with my wife? I, I tell you what, friends, honestly, it, it, when I really think about it and pray about it, what I want more than anything is for my wife to feel the expression of God's love for her through my love for her. That's, that's like the ultimate. If, if, if she was able to tell you, I know I'm loved by God because my husband loves me so much. And so, you know, what I really want is that. And I, what I really want is for my daughter to grow, grow up in an environment with parents who are prioritizing each other like that. So that means i got to let go of having it my way. And you got to let go of having it your way. And we ultimately have to let go and then come closer and closer together. This Thursday, I had the privilege of sitting with one of uh, our members, an older member, and he's been married about 60 years. So I'm listening, okay? Right, 60 years, I'm listening. And, and he said, you know, I, I don't know if I have all the answers, but one of the things I think was really important is that we learn to let go of having it our way closer and closer together. Having, it, having to have it your way stands in the way. Now, in your bulletins are these five love languages. And this is from a book, some of you might be familiar with it. It was written by Gary Chapman, I think, in the 90s. And there's a lot that can be said about this book, but I just want to touch on this for a moment. 
The big idea is that we communicate our love in different languages. As we're unique individuals and different from one another, it just makes sense that we would love in different ways. And we will extend love in different ways and we receive love in different ways. So let me give you a couple examples from my time up in Chicago with Hannah's parents. Any of you that have been married, you know that part of getting married is uh, prioritizing relationships with those who are important to the one who's important to you. And so building relationships with Hannah's parents is important to me. And, and so one of the things that I've realized after thinking this through, that Hannah's mother, she extends love through acts of service. She is like continually cooking all the time that we're there. And because of the language barrier, it's hard for us to have like great conversations, but she expresses her love to me through cooking, which is awesome most of the time. And over the course of seven years, I've learned to genuinely appreciate Korean food, because my, my mother-in-law is a Korean immigrant. But I tell you guys, sometimes when I wake up in the morning, first thing in the morning, I don't want some you know, rice cake soup, okay? I want some coffee and be let alone, okay? That, that's kind of me in the morning. Just leave me alone, give me some coffee. I don't want anything to eat. But she's expressing her love, and so I have a choice to make. Do I receive her love and affirm her love by eating the soup? Or do I say, no, thank you? Sometimes I get it right. My father-in-law, on the other hand, um, you know, what I desire from him, I think, is, is quality time. Quality time is all about, like, listening to one person. And I think I desire this so much because my father, of all people, was, was just awesome at this. And he would sit and listen to my ideas and let me talk. Can you believe it that a preacher likes people to sit and listen to his ideas? <laughs> I don't know. Crazy, huh? And, and so my father-in-law, what, what I think is true is that he's kind of like me, that he also wants people to sit and listen to him talk. And so we don't connect very well on, on that way. But what I just figured out is that my father-in-law, he loves me through gifts. And he's been a generous gift giver to Hannah. In fact, this year, he got me gloves, and they were a little bit tight, but they were fine. And then a day later, he comes with his pair of gloves, which are even nicer gloves, and he gives me those. And, and he made no big deal out of it. But because I know about this, because I, I realize that having to have it my way will stand in the way of receiving all the love that God is putting around me, I'm able to receive that as him loving me. And not walk away going, he doesn't listen to me like I want to be listened to, so he must not love me if this is not working. But no, he's expressing his love. What I'm trying to get us to do in this series is to become more intelligent about love because it will help us be more loved and be capable of extending it. The way this works out for us in a practical way is that you've got an object of your love, God has entrusted you with somebody, and then your job is to figure out and think about how does this person best receive love? And then give it to them in the way that they can receive it. And get out of your comfort zone. Do something that is beyond your presence. That's the way that Jesus loves. So I want to take you to Matthew 3 to give you an example of Jesus doing this and, and to illustrate one final point for this message. Uh, Matthew 3 is the story of John the Baptist. If you were here during our uh, Christmas program, we talked about John's parents, Zach and Elizabeth. Elizabeth got pregnant even though she was old and, and, and beyond pregnant age. Uh, and so this miraculous birth of John, who becomes John the Baptist, who in fact is Jesus' cousin. And John, he's a heck of a preacher in his own right. He's a prophet of sorts. And he starts his ministry down in the southern part of Israel. Jesus does most of his ministry in the north. John's down in the southern part of Israel, and he is baptizing people, which is the reason he's got the name John the Baptist. And there's thousands of people. The scripture even says that all the people from the countryside in all of Jerusalem came out, which is embellishment, of course, but a lot of people are coming. And he's very famous. And his message is a message of repentance, which basically means to repent is to be going in this direction and then to turn around and start going in the other direction. And these people, they, they come to John the Baptist because they've been going in one direction and, and they've been going according to their plan and it just hasn't worked out. And they feel the need to repent. 
And so they repent. And then John dumps them in the water, which is a symbolic way of saying we've washed away the sins. we washed away the resistance. We have made you clean and capable of heading in this new direction. Thousands are coming out. John had one other profound message, which was about somebody that was coming that was even greater than him. Now, he was pretty great. People thought that maybe he was the one to come. They said, no, no, no. There is one to come who is so great that I'm not even worthy of getting down and fastening the, the straps on his sandals. Which is a way of saying, he's so great that by comparison, I'm lower than low. And the day comes that, that Jesus shows up, it's his cousin of all people, and he points him out, here's the Lamb of God, and the excitement is huge. And then Jesus walks up to John, and he says the most confusing thing. He asks John to baptize him. Now, Christian theology has claimed that Jesus was the one and only perfect person to ever live on the earth. And Jesus comes up and asks to be baptized, which is basically saying, I'm ready to repent and be washed away of my sins. So for those of us who think we're just next to perfect, just saying that the most perfect person ever to live felt the need to repent and be baptized. It's part of the human experience. So John, he's confused by this, and this is what he says in reply. He says, I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. You know, according to my plan, according to my understanding of things, I'm the one that needs to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? This is not how it's supposed to work. And Jesus' response is amazing. He says, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. Now, this is one of those scriptures where if you're reading on your own, you would probably just read right past it. I, I certainly have for years. But what's so powerful about this is not... So much what Jesus says, but what he doesn't say. What Jesus doesn't say is, it should be done because this is my plan. It should be done because this is my way. It should be done because this is in my comfort zone. No, he says, it should be done because this is what God requires. And, and let, me, let me connect this to your lives. For God speaks to each and every one of you. You might not think he does. You might not have a, a, a ease at, at hearing God's message, but God is speaking to you. It's something that you can be to train yourself to hear. And, and here's how it works. You're like up late at night, you got to work the next day, and a little voice says, you should go to bed. And then your finger clicks the next episode on your Netflix, right? You stay up an hour later than you should. Or, you know, like God is saying to you, that little voice, something saying to you, hey, you should probably have the salad. Instead, you get like the cheesy fries. And that's your meal. Or, you know, God is saying inside of you, you know, I should get together with that person and we should talk and, and I should own what I can and accept forgiveness and the part in you says, no, I'm going to stay angry. We have those little voices, but often we have it our way, which is the most convenient way, which is the way that is less vulnerable, that doesn't require us to extend ourselves. And that's a problem because it stands in the way of love. Look, look, look what happens next in the story. Jesus is baptized by John. The heavens open up. A dove comes down on him, which symbol, symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And this man loves in such a way that in the course of three years, we are still talking about him 2,000 years later. And then a voice says from heaven, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Now, Jesus' ministry was all about showing us how to relate with our Father in heaven. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Pattern your life after me. So you can have the same relationship with the Father as I have. So the good news for all of you today is that when God says this to Jesus, this is my dearly loved son, he says, this is my dearly loved son right here in the front row. This is my dearly loved daughter. I take great joy in my sons and my daughters who are here. God wants you to be filled up with this good news. Because it's only when you're filled up can love pour out of your life into those who are experiencing hopelessness. Extending love is dependent on receiving love. And that's why in this 
message about learning to love like Jesus loved, we're starting off talking about how is it that you can receive the maximum amount of love possible. Because your Heavenly Father is putting it out there. He's communicating in those five love languages to you. So how can you receive it? Because he wants to build you up and fill you up so you will overflow love. So here's, here's the summation point, kind of the takeaway from, from this first week. Choosing God's way over your way frees you to love like Jesus loved. Simple as that. And it is a choice. As we go through this series, I'm going to talk about love. It's a choice. Day in, day out. Choosing to listen to that voice that tells you to extend yourself, risk yourself, have courage, put in the work, rather than having it your way. So, a couple questions in your bulletin. I, I hope that you will take those home. There's three I just included two. But to really think about it, this is probably something you haven't thought about before. In what love language is God speaking to me? Is that the five in your bulletin? Is he speaking words of affirmation? Do you need to be reading scripture, coming to Bible study, and, and hearing God's voice through those ancient words? Is he speaking it to you because through acts of service? Somebody's helping you out, or maybe he wants you to serve. That's how you begin to feel the love. God is speaking to you. And then here's the hardest question. Am I willing to accept it? God's probably trying to love you in a way that isn't exactly your way because it's not your way. You're missing it. So can you open yourself up to it? This is all about what it means to grow as a disciple. Since I got you thinking right now, I'm going to ask you to do a little speaking as our way to close, and we don't have a closing end today. Um, so I'm going to, we're going to do a responsive reading together, and then I'm going to pray for you, and we're going to depart with Charles Benjamin and Jesus to sit us out. But here, here's what I would like you to say, and I'll prompt you, okay, so just follow up with me. So, by this, by this, I will be known, I will be known, as his disciple. As his disciple. When I love, when I love, like Jesus loved. Jesus One more time, we'll do it all together. By this, I will be known as his disciple when I love like Jesus loved. Please let me pray. Grace, Lord, I lift up each and every one of these beloved sons and daughters in whom you take great joy. And God, the good news is that the way to transformation is receiving your love despite all the things that we might have. And God, give us the courage to come to you just as we are and to submit to you and accept your plan for our lives and your way and to trust it in that, Lord, so that we might extend ourselves in love to those you've entrusted to us. Let this news today, Lord, be good news. Let those who have wounds be healed. Let us be inspired in Jesus' name. Amen. So next week, part two, titled I Am Willing. Um, may the grace and the peace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you on this day, throughout this week, throughout the rest of your life.